I want to remind you of where we are. We are in the message number five of Titus, and um, let's review just a little bit. Look at the screen in front of you. First of all, we, our message number two that we looked at was Paul the slave. It was Paul the slave qualified to speak into your life. That's who he was. That's what he did. Paul the slave would come. We recognize that Titus was the, the picture of Titus is right doctrine, right leaders, and right living. Um, but we, we see that it was written by a man who claimed to be a slave. But message number three was not just Paul the slave, but it was also Paul the apostle. And Paul the apostle, a man sent with a message. It's what an apostle is. It's a messenger. And then message, th- message four came to be Paul the slave apostle, and here it is, for the sake of God's elect. We see all of this in this little introduction. Well, this morning we come to a radically different message from last week. Last week we were just dealing with Parkland, and we were dealing with the, the reality of how sinful our world is and how fallen our world is and how hopeless our world is without a rescue. Well, this morning, the great news is this. We look at eternal life promised. And this is right here in the beginning of Titus. He is saying that that this great promise is not a lie. In fact, it's kind of like what we say in this modern day. No lie. Not kidding. I'm not joking. How many of you ever said that? Or somebody's telling you something and, you know, it's really good news or whatever, and you look at them and you go, no lie? And they go, no lie. That's kind of what we see right here in in Titus chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, that this message is not too good to be true. This message is good, and it's gloriously good, but it's also gloriously true. And so I am so encouraged by this. Um, I know that last week was necessary. I know that last week, as we, as we look and we say, how in the world can things like this happen? And even so close to us, um, and, and really to some degree, that is a blessing to us in this regard, that each difficult thing that comes along in your life, that God can take the most difficult things and turn them for, those, for his children, for those who love him, for those who are called according to his purpose, he can take the most difficult things and use them. He's been using Parkland in my life. He's been using it, even as I watch some of the news this week and as I see the mayhem, as I see all that's going on, all of the craziness, all of the, poli- all the polarized positions and everything else, it continues to shout to me that we live in a fallen world and we don't have the solutions. I mean, even the news that was coming out from yesterday shows us that we don't have all the solutions. And so we come and we look at this, and we look at the one who provides the solution to a sinful and fallen world. And it's throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we see this beautiful progression of God working to bring about the great rescue, and he gives to us eternal life. Um, I want you to notice on your outline, if you haven't already, just take out a pen and get ready for this. We're going to read the passage in just a moment, but notice in the review, and we do this in part to remind you that if if you're caused to remember something a few times, you're more likely to get it and to own it. And if you are new to us this morning, we want you to know where we've been. So we've Uh, We've been looking at the introduction to Titus, and so far we've said this. Review number one is the Apostle Paul is writing to Titus, giving him some key instructions pertaining to, first bullet point there, is false what? False teachers. Very good. False teachers. They had false teachers on the island in Crete, and those churches were, those false teachers had infiltrated those young churches. The second bullet point, because of those false teachers infiltrating, there were doctrinal problems. There were doctrinal problems from the false teachers. And then you see the third bullet point there. They needed to appoint qualified church pastors or elders or spiritual leaders. That's all one one type of person. They, They needed proper leaders that were doctrinally sound, and not only doctrinally sound, 
but that we're living godly lives. You can say all the right things and not live by it and be a fraud. And he's saying you don't need frauds, you need people who know the truth and live the truth. So we see that. And that goes into the fourth bullet point there, Christian living amidst a culture of great, what did we say? Ungodliness. Was Crete your, your wonderful little Bible Belt area of, of Christianity? Absolutely not. Crete was an island in the middle of the Mediterranean. Everybody was sailing by Crete. There were ideas there from all over the world. There was commerce there. There was military there. There were people there without their families, really. I mean, th it was a rough place. People from everywhere, every walk of life. I kind of think about the, uh, the, uh, old, the old Star Wars movies. You remember those old Star Wars movies, the first ones, I'm, suddenly I'm forgetting the titles of all of them. Um, but the, you know, Obi-Ben Kenobi and Luke Skywalker go out into this desert town, they're on a planet, and they go into this bar. And they're in the bar, and there's every imaginable creature in the bar. You remember that? Do you, do you remember that? And they were rough. And, you know, they're looking for Han Solo. And they go in there, and I just remember as a kid just seeing, oh, wow, so this is what bad bars look like on other planets. You know, this is... <laughs> This is, well, that's kind of like what you would get at Crete, okay? Crete had every walk of life that was pretty rough and didn't walk in the truth. And so it was a hard place to start a church, but it was a strategic place. And so as they came in and the churches are being established, we see that it was strategic, but there was a lot to work through. And it's very similar to South Florida in some ways, and we're going to see that in just a minute. But just very quickly, number two, the overall theme of Titus is the inseparable link between faith and practice. Between faith and practice. Or another way to say it is between belief and behavior. You say you believe it, but do you live it? Do you behave this way? Um, we see that the Apostle Paul is talking to Titus saying, you, Titus, you have to teach these churches, you have to teach these people that they are called to not only believe the truth, but to live the truth. And in the introduction, we see it, Paul's introduction reveals a threefold motivation, and we said this, and I've, I've left it there for you just so you can see it. Let's say these three words that begin with an E out loud. Are you ready? We see the, all three of them. Uh, verse 1 is for the sake of faith of God's elect, so, and then the others, but we're, let's say these out loud. He writes it for the sake of evangelism, edification, and encouragement. So evangelism means you preach the gospel and God's elect, they're going to hear the gospel and they're going to respond. You faithfully preach the gospel and, and God is going to be calling people on Crete to himself. Secondly, edification. That means to build something. So they're called to hear the truth and be built up in the truth. We, you, you, if you don't know the gospel, if you don't know what God has said, if you don't know the good news of how to live for God, how can you be built up? That's the reason we look at God's word. God's word tells us how to come and allow him to work in our lives. It tells us how to live by faith. It tells us how to obey. It tells us how to live with our families. It tells us how to deal with our finances. It tells us how to deal with, with the ideas of the world. It tells us how to deal with our vices and our, all of our problems on the inside. It tells us how to celebrate the joys of life. The Bible tells us how to live life. And when we study the Bible and when we grow in the knowledge of what his word says, we are built up in the truth. And so these churches are to be built up in the truth. And not only that, evangelism and edification, but it all winds up in this great encouragement. It winds up in this great encouragement, and look out there to the side of where it says verse number two. It says, in hope of what? Circle those words. In hope of eternal life, which God promised before the ages began. And so that's part of where we're going to be this morning um, in looking at this. So I just want you to remember where we've been. Now, I'm going to show you something really, really cool. You're about to see a two and a half minute video done by an artist theologian. This artist theologian and a couple of other guys, there's a few of them that have worked together, but they've come up with something called the Bible Project. 
And what they've done is, and you can go to the next slide there so everybody can see it, it's a visual storying that, that tells the story of the Bible. It meets the Bible. This is where we, we do visual storying, and it's going to make sense to you in just a moment. But I want you to see the very first part of a, a little bit longer video. It's about an eight-and-a-half-minute video that tells the whole story of Titus. We're just going to look at the very start of it. And you tell me if this doesn't help you understand the context and the beginning of the book of Titus. Kill the lights and hit the tape. Paul's letter to Titus. Titus was a Greek follower of Jesus who was for years a trusted co-worker and traveling companion of Paul's. He had helped Paul in a number of crisis situations in the past, and in this letter we discover that Paul had assigned him the task of going to Crete, a large island off the coast of Greece, to restore order to a network of house churches. Now, Cretan culture was notorious in the ancient world. One of the Greek words for being a liar was kretidzo, to be a Cretan. These people were infamous for treachery and greed. Most of the men on the island had served as mercenary soldiers to the highest bidder, and the island cities were known as being unsafe, plagued by violence and sexual corruption. However, the island of Crete had many strategic harbors, and they serviced cities all over the ancient Mediterranean Sea. And so, from Paul's point of view, Crete was the perfect place to start a network of churches. Now, we don't know the details, but somehow these churches came under the influence of corrupt Cretan leaders. They said they were Christians, but they were ruining the churches. And so, Paul assigned Titus with the task of going there to set things straight, and this letter provided the instructions. It has a pretty straightforward design. After a brief introduction, Paul gives Titus clear instructions about his tasks in the church. He then offers guidance about the new kind of household and then about the new kind of humanity that the gospel could create in these Cretan communities. Paul then closes the letter with some final greetings. So, Paul opens the whole thing by reminding Titus that his message as an apostle is about the hope of eternal life, that is, the life of the new creation, that is available starting now through Jesus the Messiah. And this hope was promised long ago by the God who does not lie. Now, this little opening comment introduces an important theme underlying the whole letter. One of the problems in the Cretan churches was that they had assimilated their ideas about Jesus, the Christian God, to their ideas about the Greek gods that they grew up with, specifically Zeus, their chief god. Cretan people claimed that Zeus was actually born on their island, and they loved to tell stories and mythologies about Zeus's underhanded character. He would seduce women and lie to get his way. And Paul wants to be really clear. The God revealed through Jesus is totally different than Zeus. His basic character traits are faithfulness and truth, which means the Christian way of life will be about truth also, which will be a real change for these Cretans. Isn't that kind of cool? Yeah. Tells the story a little bit. Now listen, you need to watch that on your computer at home where you can see the image right up close. In fact, I want you to see the image. Um, it, it, it's, it's quite a... A, a wide image where you can go through it and you can see as, as the whole thing comes together over the eight and a half minutes. But what we just looked at was this little section in the upper left-hand corner where he shows this idea that all that, that's going on in, Cre in Cretan culture is around a very worldly perspective. And it's a very worldly perspective that not only has their own sin issues that right there in town, but also in their wider history and in their wider views. I mean, they believed in the Greek gods, in the Roman gods of Roman mythology. And you even heard that Zeus, the great god, that many of them would say that he was born where or he came from where? From Crete. And, you know, the interesting thing about Greek mythology and Roman mythology was it's not that there was, there was a canon of it, and it's not that there was, it was all written down and, and very, very um, well thought out and well transmitted from century to century. It was just folklore, and many different people had different versions of it. And so the, the Cretans, you know, when somebody sailed up on their ship, they said, well, welcome to Crete. Your first time here? Yeah, well, you know, Zeus came from here, buddy. I mean, you know, and, they, and they, would, they would begin to tell their version of all of this foolishness. And to them, the greatest God, being Zeus, the greatest God in their mythology was a liar. 
And so when they would begin to think about God, when they would begin to think about them, that they automatically thought of a seducer, liar, trick, one, one that was involved with trickery. Now, can you not see that that's a wonderful demonic play, play by the devil to put in people's minds when they think of God to make them think of a liar in their folklore? And so it would be, it would be a very natural way to begin to claw away at the image of God and the character of God, which is Satan, what Satan always does. He not only did it through Greek mythology and Roman mythology, but he does it today. He does it today right here in South Florida. He does it, he does it right in our own minds, in our own hearts, in our own circumstances of all the media and all the education and all the things that are there. Very often there are subtle mythologies and their subtle lies that we see in that. And that's what I want you to see in this, that in this present day and time, we are not so very different than the circumstances of which uh, the, the Greeks and the Romans found themselves. I, I want us to look and I want us to see the passage of Scripture. And, and as you see this, I want you to see where we're going to focus. And then we're going to see how similar we are to where, where they were and why this letter matters to us once again. But look with me in the box on your page. It says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Christ or of Jesus Christ. The word servant, the word apostle, we looked at those very carefully. Servant, the actual word is you could put there what? Instead of servant? Very good, slave, that's the actual word, doulos, D-O-U-L-O-S, doulos. And the apostle of Jesus Christ, so on both ends of that beautiful spectrum. For the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. He's saying, I'm writing you so that you can proclaim the truth. God's people can be called to himself and that they might live in that way. Look at verse two, and here it is, for their sake. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. Now, does that make more sense why the Apostle Paul would have written that to Titus and to those churches? The God who never lies. You see, he had to clarify, this God doesn't lie. The true God doesn't lie. Because you're used to hearing about Zeus. Look at the next part that is here. And at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. We said from the beginning, from message number one, that this is an introduction that should not be skipped over. It shouldn't be fast forwarded through. It shouldn't be where we just kind of look at it and we do the yada, yada, yada thing as we're reading it. No, there's tremendous theological importance in this, and there's tremendous practical importance to this for us as Christians in this day and time. And I want you, as people in Sheridan Hills, to begin to see that every part of God's Word has everything to do with our lives. God's Word means much to us. And when we're tempted to blast through, when we're tempted to skip through, I want to encourage you not to do that. I'm going to be honest with you, and I'm going to tell you a, a subtlety that I noticed several years ago as just a Christian and as a reader. Um, I love to read the Bible, but I also love to read other books. And a lot of times when I'm reading other theological books or help books that have to do with help with spiritual things, and as I'm, and as I'm reading those, I noticed one time, while I was on vacation and reading a couple of books, I noticed that sometimes when I come in a Christian book to a place in the book where there's a passage of Scripture, I noticed that sometimes I would skip the passage of Scripture. Can everybody say, that's bad? <laughs> bad pastor. I'm just being honest with you. In pride, in whatever, oh, I already know this, when I didn't necessarily know it, I, I just kind of blast through it. And the Holy Spirit convicted me about that and said, when you come up to the stuff, that's the most important stuff in this book that you're reading, I'm not talking about the Bible, in this, this book that you're reading is where my word is there and where they're talking about my word. Be careful to read my word. I want to challenge you, don't ever skip scripture when it comes time to read it. Just say, okay, 
I'm going to see if this, and then I, I look at that and I say, was the author correct in his application of this? Nothing wrong with that. Evaluate that. But the word is true that we must hold on to. And there are subtle things that will come along to cause us to forget how important God's word is. And so we don't want to skip through things like this. The, the book of Titus is going to move much faster over the next few weeks. Um, and as we get going and, and through it, we'll pick up a lot of speed. But we want to see this ground basis that is here. And that brings us down here to the bottom of your outline where it says, recognize the similar settings of Crete and our modern society. You see, we will understand the letter of Titus so much more if we have a really good understanding of the biblical, bib, what we call biblical backgrounds or the setting or the context of what it was being written to. That's why you need to study the surrounding ideas of that. Number one, it's very similar in this. We too, in modern day, in modern day society, we too have many myths around us. They had myths, they had Greek myths, they had Roman myths, they had them that, that, that were very intense. There were all kinds of various other um, ideologies and philosophies that had come into, especially the high commerce areas of, uh, like Greece or like Corinth or um, like Crete. Um, but here we see that they had myths. Well, we have myths too. And some of those myths are kind of minor, and some of them are major. And I want you to understand what I mean by that. Um, you could say superstitions very often be, can be kind of minor. We don't really think about them very much. They could be very small. I shared Wednesday night about um, various superstitions that one of my family members had. I'm not going to share that again, um, but you missed it on Wednesday night. I encourage you to come on Wednesday night. We really study the Bible and have a great time. We meet right over there in the ministry center. I encourage you to come. But it, you know people who are superstitious. You know people that say, oh, well, if this happens, that means this. Or if this is going on, that means this. Or if you hear this, that means that. Don't walk under a ladder. Watch out. Black cat ran in front of you. What in the world does that mean? Step on a crack, break your mama. What does it say? <laughs> Step on a crack, break your mama's back. I mean, you know, you know all of these little, little superstitions that can be very minor. It can be out there. But sometimes there's even something. How many of you went ahead and stepped over the crack anyway? Because you <laughs> really love your mom. Right? I mean, we, 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 can be, we can be tempted to kind of be in the culture and kind of be thinking, oh, I believe that, you know, God's sovereign in control, but you, you, know, you ain't going to do it. I, I want to encourage you to recognize whether my, minor ones or major ones. I mean, what, what would be some major ones? I mean, this, when we start looking when we start dealing with science and we start dealing with other issues that are here, you know, the modern age comes along. It, it wasn't until the last 150 years that anybody doubted that God created the world. And, I, you know, I don't want to blow your mind too much, but, I mean, I really believe the Bible when it comes to the fact that God created the world. And, and I don't think he needed evolution to do it. And, and I think that if you do a little bit of research and if you start looking at some things, a lot of the things that look apparently like evolution can also very beautifully point to the creation record that is in line with Genesis chapter 1 and 2. It doesn't have to be this massive contradiction. Now, I'm not going to say if you don't believe in biblical creation based upon in this way that you can't understand the gospel. I, I believe that you can, but I just want you to know that that has been brought out as, as signed, sealed, delivered fact when, in fact, there are other very, very, very intelligent people from New St. Andrews, from St. Andrews, from Edinburgh, from Yale, from Harvard, from Caltech, from you name it, there are Bible-believing scientists that say, hold on, not so fast. If you begin to look at DNA, if you begin to look at the proteins that are needed for the formation of life, it would take more faith to actually believe in the random nature that would create DNA of a human body than to ever think that God, in the story of the Bible, is plausible. There's, there's very often other sides of an argument. And I just want you to see that, that in this present day and time, if you can convince the world that, hey, you made yourself, and you can convince the world that a creator God's a fairy tale, 
I mean, just look at what we dug up over here in Florida or what we dug up in Africa, or look at this. I mean, this, this proves it. Well, really? Were you there when it got covered up? Do you really know? I mean, how many times has science been absolutely incorrect about a lot of things? I mean, they put leeches on George Washington when he was sick, and they were letting blood out of his body when he desperately needed it, and he was the former president of the United States. I mean, science has often been very wrong. And so I want you to see that, you know, whether it's that issue or many other, even if you just put that issue off to the side and you start looking at many other myths, there are many myths that our world, our society believes emphatically that are certainly anti-scriptural. There's a second thing here. Some of these myths are, they range from the ignorant, simply uneducated, simply not knowing, to the, de- to the demonic. And I can, I can give you an example of this. Um, you know, Marcy and I used to live in Africa, and in sub-Saharan Africa really deals with AIDS, HIV. In fact, there are millions of people with AIDS today in sub-Saharan Africa. And not only in sub-Saharan Africa, but in several areas of Asia, AIDS has been growing um, incredibly fast. And it's interesting that as AIDS, as the awareness of this illness and it was being spread, in very remote regions, and um, uh, this is a little bit PG right here, but um, in very remote regions for many families, uh, excuse me, in many cultures, um, the way for a man to get rid of AIDS, to be healed from AIDS, was to have sex with a young virgin. That was a widespread myth. Now you think about that. That in order, if, if, if you did that, and if you did it enough, you'd be free from AIDS. Now, how foolish is that? How wrong is that? How wicked is that? How demonic is that? Now, not only was that found to be the case in widespread, very remote areas of Africa, but it was also found to be a commonly believed lie in other areas of Asia, far removed from Africa. Now, friends, to me, I don't know, but that kind of just points to demonic-type belief. And there's many demonic-type myths that greatly deceive people and pull them away from the truth. And and it reminds us of John 10.10 that says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. Now, Satan, in all of his desire, he is seeking to claw away the image of God and claw away the holiness of God and to to rage against all that God has created. And so we we can begin to see that just like the Cretans dealt with all kinds of of things that would draw them away from God here in America, we do the same thing. It's just 2,000 years later. Look at the next one there. Number two, not only do we have many myths around us, but we have many lies around us. And what I mean by this is actual lies. I mean, it, it individualized lying. This is, this is the idea that truth is not valued. And I've lived in a few different countries, so I've, I can compare it a little bit. Um, it's kind of true that Americans tend to be more truthful than, than a lot of other places. Um, I, I, it's kind of amazing. I mean, you can go out into the heartland of America and, you know, if somebody shot your mailbox or whatever and you see them at the grocery store and say, did you shoot my mailbox with your shotgun? He's like, well, yeah, I did. I mean, you know, I mean, there, it tends to be a little bit more like that. You know, I'll just, just seeing if I could. Um, I mean, you know, and people would do that. I mean, just a little bit more honest, not necessarily. There's liars in America just like anywhere else. But our culture, because of the Protestant Reformation and because of our puritanical roots that were in the, col- in the colonies, not, not completely dominant, obviously, but because the gospel has been here, there tends to be a, a higher value of truth a higher value of personal responsibility. That's some of the good things that we would see in our culture. And there's other places that I've lived that that's not at all the case. In fact, you just assume that someone's lying until you uh, learn that they are a truth teller. 
I mean, some of you have lived in places like that, where the, the story that you're going to get about the car or the story that you're going to get about whatever it is, um, is, is, you know, you're going to have to work through whether and, and how to position yourself in order to not be taken advantage of. I happen to have a mechanic that I, I believe tells the truth. He's not the cheapest, but I will gladly pay more for a mechanic that tells the truth than for a mechanic who knows I'm not going to know the difference. And so, you know, I'm kind of, kind of thankful for that. But here we see the individualized line is a big deal. We see that in, in the book of, uh, book of Titus that these people, I mean, they were known to be liars, personal liars. You couldn't trust them for anything was the idea. Look at the next part here. Not only individualized line, but also institutionalized line. You say, what is institutionalized line? I, I believe that we have a major, massive problem with this. I believe that there are major industries. I believe that everything from all of the movements of marketing. I, I was a marketing major, a finance major, a marketing major from Florida State. And I remember it didn't really matter if it was true. If you could make people believe it, that will sell your product. I mean, they, they talked about that idea. You, you need to convince them that they're unhappy with what they have in order to displace that so that they will want something else. And so, I mean, so you don't have to lie to be able to do that, but very often that's, that's part of the picture. You, you tell part of the truth, but not the other part of the truth. Um, there, there's not only in business where you would see that, but in government. I mean, we have elaborate law schemes in order to try to know what the truth is and to stop people from lying in order to tell the truth. In fact, one of the biggest ways you get in trouble is if you lie to the authorities. If they catch you in a lie, which isn't that hard to do, if they catch you in a lie, then then there you are. So we, we see institutionalized issues that not all of the truth is what part of the truth is there. Um, there's so much that could be said about this picture of how truthfulness is not a high value in a fallen society. It more has to do with what you can get away with. Now, uh, another thing that I think is going to play into the coming years, and especially play into um, the truth of the Bible in a, in a fallen world, is this. Hollywood and technology has now come to the point where you can see something and it looks absolutely, completely real. I mean, you look at it and you're like, that guy has two heads. You look at it, that guy just jumped over a building. You look at it and you go, well, I know that that couldn't be true, but it sure did look like that happened. Or whatever, through through what we call CGI, computer-generated imagery. Um, If something is CG, the computer can be used to make visual images that are very convincing. You add sound and a little bit of music to it, and it's also very moving. So it's it's convincing and it's moving. And you can cause any story to be told as truth, or at least look like it's real. Now, many of you would say, well, yeah, but, you know, you watch that, you know the storyline, you know it's not true. Yeah, but there's, there's other things that are more subtle than that. This, this is just talking about visual Im- imagery, and I, and, and I think that that's, you know, in the old day, you would call it trick photography. It was just based upon angles and timing, but today it's, you know, more, more sophisticated than that, far more than that. But it's not only in that idea, but it's also in news and media, Um, you can quote certain statistics to say anything. If we have enough statistics now, enough studies have been done, the internet provides information, you can pick and choose what information you present in order to present a convincing perspective. Um, it's, it's, it's a very powerful age in which we live of, of news. And how many times have you ever heard somebody say, well, it was right there on the news. It has to be true. You know, we used to think that way. I think over the last probably couple of years, we're thinking that way less. And as things become more polarized, as things become more positioned, depending on what part of the truth you tell, it can be very convincing and it can be very deceiving. So I'm not sure 
that we live in so very different a society than the Cretans did. Now, they didn't have CGI, and they didn't have all of these 24-hour news networks that present whatever side they want to present, but they had a whole network, and they had a whole culture that was filled with other ideas and hard, um, long-term beliefs that were, that were part of a lie um, that, was, that was very convincing. Now, I want you to see this as well on your outline. The bottom of it, I, I want you to notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. What happened in Genesis chapter 3? Many of you have learned this as we've been studying. What happened in Genesis chapter 3? Very good, the fall. Now, you can turn in your Bible or you can just listen. It's not going to be on the screen. I want you to hear what happened in Genesis chapter 3. In verse 1, Genesis chapter 3, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast on the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman... Indeed, God has said, you shall not eat, excuse me, In, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it or touch it or you will die. Listen to this, the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. So he comes a lying. He starts off a lying, directly contradicting what God has said. First of all, questioning, did God really say that? And you know what? To her credit, she got it right. And she told him, yes. He said, actually, we can eat from the, the trees that are in the garden, just not from the tree in the middle of the garden. If we do, we'll die. Oh, you will not surely die. You see, he comes a line. In John chapter 8 and verse 44, listen to these words. Jesus is speaking, and he's speaking to those that are contradicting the truth. And he says, you are of your father, the devil. You want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of lies. That's John 8, 44. He's a liar, and he's the father of lies. In 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, no wonder, for Satan disguises himself as an angel of what? An angel of light. So he comes looking, he, he's disguising himself as an angel of light. Paul writes to the Corinthians in, in verse 3 of that same chapter. He says, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. You see, we live in a world that has fallen in sin, and there's a very real adversary, and this really very real adversary is a lying adversary. And he's a lying adversary that, among other things, is called the father of lies or the angel of light, seeking to deceive. I want us to see this morning that all of that is just the opposite of who God is. Flip your sheet over and notice the box on the page. Look what it says at the top on page two. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. Now, it's interesting that it says, God who never lies, and then the very next word after that is promised. You see, a, a promise, that's words spoken. That's a promise made. It's a, it's, as we'll see here in a moment, God even gives an oath in this, the picture of spoken truth. And this is who God is. This is what God does. I want you to see in this. There are two key usages here. And I, well, I want you to see. In hope of eternal life, this is what it is all about. It's not too good to be true. When we look at this eternal life that is spoken of, and if you would, up in that box, circle that phrase again, eternal life, because that is so key to what Paul is getting at. Paul is saying, Titus, Eternal life awaits for God's people. 
This is what they have to look forward to. This is what they need. This is their hope. When you're preaching and teaching in churches in Crete, Titus, make sure that they know that eternal life is here. This is what it's all about. This is the big picture. And so notice this. He says that this is not too good to be true. God doesn't lie. He's made this promise, and he's going to deliver on it. Now, the word hope is here, and I want you to see this, that we, we, we think about the idea of hope. Um, there's two usages of the word hope in English. Number one, there's a wish. Um, it's a wish, a desire. You can fill that in. It's a wish or a desire. You're, you're hoping you, you really would, would like for this thing to happen or you would like for this to be the case. You're hoping that this is it. This is your, your desire. But there's, and that's usually in a form of a verb. You, we usually say, well, I hope that. And that's, I mean, what you're saying is, that's what I want. But look at the next one, and this is really important. Number two is, it's also used in English to describe an expectation or a confidence. Well, here's my hope. This is my hope. This is what I'm banking on. You may want to, you you ever heard somebody say that before? This is what I'm depending on. It's not just that I want this, but I believe this to be true. And I believe that this is going to happen. This is my reasonable expectation. Now, this is really, really important for Christians at Sheridan Hills because of this. There are many, many people who probably come in these doors, sit down, and hear messages, hear the songs, hear Christian fellowship, and they don't, they don't realize that God wants us to have number two more than we have number one in this idea of hope. He wants us to have the hope which is an expectation He wants us to have a hope which is a a confidence in him. You see, this is where faith comes into play. It's not merely, I'm hoping that he will save me. It's that you're able to say, this is my hope. No, my hope lies here. My hope lies in him. My hope is founded in him. Now, English presents a problem to us because of these two very different usages of the word hope either a wish or an expectation. I hope you're getting this. I I hope I'm being clear enough. Notice this. Totally different words are in Koine Greek. And um, I want you to see this. The word wish, there's three different words there that are used for wish. Acts chapter 27, verse 9. Is this, here's the idea of, of what was used in Acts 27, verse 9, that they're wishing. The apostle Paul is coming along and they're coming up on Cyprus and there is a there's a storm in the dark. They're on a ship. The ship is about to sink. It's being driven onto the rocks. And so what did they do? They said, we know we're about to crash, and, and this storm is so raging, we probably will all drown. And so they put out, the Bible says in Acts chapter 27, they put out four anchors, and they prayed for daylight because it was dark, they couldn't see what they were doing. So they put out four anchors and they're praying for daylight, holding, hoping that the ship will hold together and catch and not be driven into the rocks and everybody die. And so it's, it, they even use the word pray. Many translators use the word pray, but th- that's the here. They're hoping for it, they want that. That's what they're wishing for. In the next one, Bulamai. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 is very interesting. The Lord is slow regarding, excuse me, the Lord is not slow regarding his promise. And he goes on to say, not wishing that any would perish, but that all would come to the knowledge of repentance and the truth. So it's this, it's this, this, this desire, this wish that is there. Look at Theo, or Othello. In Othello, we see Galatians chapter 4, verse 2, or verse 20. The Apostle Paul's writing, and he uses that word. He says to the Galatians, I wish that I could come see you. I wish that I could come see you right now. It was was just his wish, but he he was saying, I just can't. Um, So this this is the idea of a wish. But look at the very, very different usage of the word hope. And this is what will take you through death safely. This is what will take you through cancer. 
This is what will take you through the fallenness of this world. And I want you to see that Romans 8, 24 is one of many places where we see this, and it, it is a, it's a radically different picture than a wish. Look what it says in verse 24. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? He says you're, you, you, you're not either wishing or you're not in faith believe, having this expectation. You already see it. It's there. Look at verse 25. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Right out there to the side, faith. You see, this is part of where faith and hope come together. And it's not a wishful thing. It's a confidence in faith. And it's a confidence not in your faith, but it's in the object of your faith, which is the one who made the promise, which is Jesus. You see, faith is, is what we see. It's a, it, it's a glad anticipation. And that's what we see in this verse, Titus chapter 1, verse 2. Fill that in. It's a glad anticipation. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, we see it said another way, that there is this glad expectation that, that salvation is coming. Listen to verse 21, and I think it's on the screen in front of you. For he, that is Jesus, was known before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in the last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And now look at the end of the verse. And so your faith and hope are what? And God. So your faith and your hope, your confidence is in God. It, Jesus rose from the dead. You're good. If your faith is in him, then, then it's, it's going to come to pass that this is not just a wish. It's an assurance. It's a glad anticipation. You're, you're waiting on that. Look at the next one there. Fill it in. It's the grounds for an expectation. And we see that in Colossians 1.27. Look what the screen says. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the what? The hope of glory. This, it's not a wishful thing. It's the expectation of it. Because of Christ, you can have confidence that God delivers on his promises to save you. Look at the next one there. It's the object upon which hope is fixed. So this hope, when we talk about it in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 1, says it's very similar to Titus, but look what he says. Paul, an apostle of Christ, by the command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. So what is our hope? What's the, what's the object of our hope? Christ Jesus. He's the one that we're hoping in. You see, this is more of a noun than this is a verb. This is, this is who he is. This is what he's done. This is what he's promised. Now, it is my prayer that as we are looking at this and as you are learning this, that you would start to see that, that the Scripture has designed for God's children not to run around wondering whether or not they're loved, not to run around wondering whether or not God is their Savior, not to run around wondering if He is going to deliver on His promise. But throughout the Bible, we see that God is a God of truth, and Satan is the father of lies. And when God says something, He always delivers on it, and it can become our great confidence. Man will let you down. Women will let you down. Your children will let you down. Your parents will let you down. Your boss will let you down. The world around you will let you down. The circumstances of this life will let you down. But God, when he promises, he delivers. I want you to see this. You see, we need to understand a truthful, reliable God is the God that we have, and he cannot lie. He cannot lie. This is one of those things that God cannot do. He cannot do it, and I want you to see this in Hebrews chapter 6. And you need to have your eyeballs on the page just because most of it is only on the page and not on the screen. Look at Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no, no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. Verse 14, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. So there was the promise. 
And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all of their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. Verse 17, so when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. Verse 18, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the what? To the hope set before us. You see, that's a noun. And what he's saying is, you can hold fast to the hope. Why? Because God doesn't lie. Throughout the scripture, we see that God is a God of truth. In fact, we see that everything rises and falls upon the reliability of what he says. And this is why the Bible that you hold in your lap and the Bible that we have printed on our page, the truth of God's word is so important. That he has preserved his word so we can know what he says. And he gives us his word that we may walk in the truth. And I want you to see this and fill this in on your outline. Everything is possible with God unless it violates his character or contradicts his purposes. And that is what we see in Hebrews chapter 6. God will not violate his character, and he will not contradict his purpose. He will never and can never do either one of those. Now, I want a God that is limited by that. Put out here to the side, not Zeus. You see, Zeus's character was filled with himself, and Zeus's character was filled with deception. But God is the creator God, the holy God that we've sung about already, who says that his character and his purposes are perfect. Notice this as well. Everything about God is true. He is the embodiment of truth. Everything that, is, that can be said about God that is true is who he is. He is the embodiment of truth. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. He's even called the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. So we're, he can't be separated from truth. John 14, 6 says, For the, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He calls himself the truth. I'm not a truth. I am the truth. Very interestingly, when Jesus was being ridiculed and mocked and had a private hearing with Pilate, in John chapter 18 and verse 37 through 38, it says that Pilate said to him, so you're a king? He answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Now, Pilate, in his typical Roman surrounding society and philosophy, said, what is truth? Truth was standing there looking at him, and he missed it. Instead, he opted to, to engage in a philosophical question because that's where he went in his humanistic, sinful thinking. Jesus said, I am the truth. Jesus said, I have come to bear witness of the truth, and you're going to see that God loves the world. He loves the world so much that he lays down his life for the world. So everything that is true about God is true in, in all of the universe, and he, Jesus, is the embodiment of this truth. Notice the last thing that, I want, that we have here. It's John chapter 1 and verse 12, not 14. I love verse 14, and I default to that so often, but it's, it makes a different point. Correct that and put on there John 1, 12, and notice what it says. And I'd like to ask you, if you would, to read John 1, 12 out loud with me. Would you read this? But to all who did receive him, 
who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You see, to all who believed him, to all who, who received him, believed in his name, this is the recognition of truth. He gives the right to become children of God. You see, that is the greatest hope that you could ever want. And that is what the Apostle Paul is saying to Titus, is that you have this hope. And the hope is eternal life. And it's made by a God who does not lie. This is something worth living for, and this is something worth dying for. Why do you want to live in the mythologies of the world around you? Why do you want to live in the lies? Why do you want to live a lie when you can live the truth? And I would say that to you, church, that we are called to be children of the light, not the angel of light, but to be children of the one who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Come to me and I will set you free. Would you stand together with me for prayer?